We've been talking about historical parallels to what we are seeing today. We want to play for you now this moment from Richard Nixon's presidential nomination acceptance speech in August of 1968. When the richest nation in the world can't manage its own economy, when the nation with the greatest tradition of the rule of law is plagued by unprecedented lawlessness, when a nation has been known for a century for equality of opportunity is torn by unprecedented racial violence, and when the President of the United States cannot travel abroad or to any major city at home without fear of a hostile demonstration, then it's time for new leadership for the United States of America. Okay. Joining us now, author and NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss, also with us, Erin Haynes. She is editor-at-large for The 19th, a nonprofit newsroom focused on the intersection of women, politics, and policy. She recently wrote an opinion pieces, piece for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution on protecting the city's history of success and compromise. We will get to that in just a moment. Michael Beschloss, uh, parallels to 1968? Yeah, one of them is law and order, Mika. You know, in that, that same speech that Nixon gave in Miami Beach, he said, I'm for law and order and don't think it's a code word for racism. I also want progress and justice. But what people heard was law and order. And what Nixon, the reason why Nixon said that was that there was a very powerful third party candidate, George Wallace, who had been governor of Alabama. He was the one who was saying the cities are not safe. We need law and order using it very much as a code word for racism. By the fall of 1968, Wallace was in one poll running as high as 25 percent, a real threat to Nixon's election. And so Nixon got louder and louder on that theme of law and order. And uh, Nixon, some of the people in Nixon's entourage felt that if Nixon had been uh, not so tough on the need to forestall riots such as, ha such as had happened in the long, hot summer of 1967 and the riots of the Democratic Convention 1968, if he had not been so tough, they felt he would not have, uh, have won the election. Ever since, yeah. many candidates, particularly on the Republican side, have felt that law and order is sort of a magic incantation. We may, seeing that, we, we may now be seeing that with Donald Trump. You know, I've been, uh, Michael, uh, to, uh, to talk about what a, what a potent message that is. Uh, my entire life, I've, I've had people say, oh, the South uh, went, uh, you know, the South went Republican because everybody in the South are racists. And I'd say, well, I don't know about that. I know in my family, I came from, you know, my mom's side uh, is a family of FDR Democrats. My grandmom had FDR's picture on the wall uh, until the day she died uh, when she was 93 years old. And if she ever voted for a Republican, she didn't admit it out loud. But as a young <laughs> kid, I remember uh, in 68, that's five, six years old, 68, 69, 70 with Kent State, the May Day violence. I remember my parents watching horrified. My mom, you know, talked about voting for Kennedy. Uh, well, my dad was voting for Nixon in 60. Uh, my mom voted for, for Democrats faithfully until 1968, 1972. So that is a potent message. And, and for those that just say that is a code, those are code words for racism. Yes, it was for Wallace. But for others, it's an effective message without That's race right. attached to it. At least it was in my household. No, that's exactly right. And, you know, you add the Wallace vote in 1968 to the Nixon vote. That was about 55 percent. Donald Trump was 22 years old in 1968. He was watching that. I guarantee you he remembers how powerful a message that was. So, Aaron Haynes, uh, you're writing at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution about protecting Atlanta's long legacy of success and compromise. Where does that legacy stand right now and what are you looking at? Well, it's a legacy that's in the balance. You know, in 1864, Atlanta burned to the ground during the Civil War. Uh, but I think that General Sherman could hardly imagine a black woman running uh, the capital of the South, uh, a capital that is majority black, that uh, has uh, a track record of, of 
successful black political leadership, successful black business. And, you know, she, uh, Mayor Keisha Bottoms uh, is trying to hold her city together uh, in the midst of uh, the unrest that is roiling the country. Uh, you know, to Joe's point, we are seeing on full display that racism is not just limited to our home region of the South. Uh, these protests are erupting from coast to coast because racism is a national problem and it is being uh it is, it is being protested nationally in this moment. And so mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Bottoms is navigating her dual identity as a black woman, uh, but also as, as mayor of a city that has a long legacy of trying to find a way forward and to continue to make racial progress uh, with, with all of its citizens. And by the way, I, I was born in Atlanta uh, oh. in 63, uh, and uh, we lived there through uh, 69, 1970. And it has been uh, a story of extraordinary progress. And, uh, uh, you know, other than Hank Aaron hitting his 715th home run on April 8th, 1974, I've got to say, as an Atlantan, I don't know if I've been any more proud than I was watching the mayor. Yeah. Uh, I believe it was on was it Friday night or Saturday it was night? Saturday. The police talking Friday night, night was talking, talking about uh, being right. the mother of four black mm -hmm. men. That was extraordinary. That was an extraordinary moment, and you just said it perfectly. Uh, Mayor Bottoms was was balancing so many different things. I've got to say, I, I I haven't seen that type of leadership in crisis in quite some time. Yes, and and frankly, you're seeing a lot of black women that are balancing just those identities. I mean, we just heard from Congresswoman Val Demings, right, the former uh, police chief of Orlando who wrote a very powerful op-ed, really holding her former law enforcement colleagues to account, asking them, what the hell is wrong with you? And, and coming onto this show and talking about the need for police reform. Listen, racism is on the ballot in 2020. I'm hearing from Black voters who are absolutely concerned about the pandemic within a pandemic that is just the latest inequality to be exposed during this entire coronavirus crisis, that being uh, the the, the uh, inequality between policing uh, and, and, and many black communities across this country that has been longstanding. And just as there has to be a new normal around coronavirus, there has to be a new normal around how race is handled in this country. And so regardless of who was in the White House going forward, black voters are looking for someone who is going to govern with their safety and survival in mind. And so I think mm. that that changes the stakes uh, for the vice presidential conversation for sure. Uh, and yeah. even uh, even louder, the cry for uh, a black woman uh, to be on the ticket with Joe Biden. He has certainly uh, tried to express that he understands uh, the pain and the frustration that African-Americans are going through in this moment, even as we have heard very little in response from that, uh, from President Trump, uh, who says that, that he is also reaching out to black voters, but, but ran, uh, to Michael Beschloss's point, in 2016 on a law and order theme, even while he was asking Black voters, what the hell do you have to lose? When black voters hear law and order, it's a very, very different message from what uh, the rest of the country hears. And I'll tell you what, when you do talk about Joe Biden's vice presidential picks, mm. you know, Mika, before Friday night, mm -hmm. uh, I thought that Biden, he promised to pick a woman. It didn't have to be a black woman. Mm. Uh, but I will tell you, after Friday night, mm. after seeing the mayor speak, after seeing Mayor Lightfoot speak, after seeing Val Demings speak, uh, I actually think uh, as we move closer to the election, uh, that requirement just may be added to the list. Aaron Haynes and Michael Beschloss, thank you both very much. And we have much more ahead on this extraordinary moment in history. A global pandemic converges with an outcry over police brutality and the result is a nation in crisis. We'll discuss the implications for race relations and the overall health of the nation. Morning Joe is coming right back. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.